Institute was created in 2008 for all the right reasons. Uh, it's, uh, we wanted to signal to East Asia that we appreciated uh, the relationships, we appreciated uh, their history and, and importance in, in many different areas. But we didn't always know as much as we needed to know. And so this was going to be our way of learning more uh, about cultures, about language, about politics, about economics uh, in, in one of the most important regions of the world. Uh, in 2009, our good friend Richard Liu, an international businessman from Hong Kong, made a contribution of $2 million to the East Asia Institute. And it was then that we expanded our commitment and were able to bring uh, more, more scholars, uh, have more lectures, and, and basically uh, provide students with an opportunity also to travel to, to Asia and East Asia, uh, giving us uh, broader connections. Many you know, Chinese students as in one program came here as a consequence. Many of our faculty have been to Japan as a consequence. Today, the East Asia Institute offers, um, as here today, uh, lectures, seminars, um, conferences, uh, film festivals, uh, all kinds. Uh, we actually had a very good, interesting, exciting visual art exhibition as well. Uh, we host um, scholars and friends uh, from different parts of East Asia, notably China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, uh, but from other, many other different countries. I would like to take a moment here to uh, recognize some of the individuals who have uh, joined us here. Um, Dr. Huashang Yao is the director of the East, uh, East Asia uh, Initiatives and Institute here. Uh, raise your hand. You can go to person. Do you want to you want to go somewhere? You want to expand? You want to know what uh, scholarships are available? He's the go-to person. Uh, uh, Dr. Mimi uh, Yu, Associate Director of the East Asia. A, a go-to person, she's one of the most knowledgeable individuals of this uh, region and travels, and we actually will be representing um, UTSA on my behalf um, this summer. July? We have two groups going to Japan. Two groups going to Japan. Uh, we um, I just had a chance a second ago to meet the uh, Council General uh, Tatsuro um, Amano, from, uh, who is Council General of Japan, and the office is right here in, in, in Houston. Thank you so much for this presentation. And I'm going to go easy here because his name is... It's Nozaki, Nozaki, Dr. Misaki Nozaki, uh, is here. He is uh, from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Sciences and came from Washington, D.C. Uh, from Princeton, here today, um, uh, uh, Dr. Ishu um, Karoji. Karoji. Um, and uh, also here with us, um, Dr. Satoru Yamasa. Came all the way from Tokyo. Uh, so we are honored to have such distinguished guests. Uh, and, and I noted also, just I don't have the list of the folks, but I noted that we do have a, a, good, a good group of individuals from the city of San Antonio, uh, Bear County, the World Affairs Council, uh, plant manager of Arusha, Texas Incorporated, from the Japanese American Society of San Antonio. And, uh, and of course, a very, very special guest in person is my wife, Dr. Harrigan. <laughs> uh, and most importantly, uh, you're here. And you're here because uh, you're curious about the, the world. Uh, you know that other parts of the world play a significant role in our own development. Uh, and one day, some of you hope 
two of you to be in Japan, uh, or maybe you'll be in Washington to visit a, a group. And by the way, if you go to Washington, we have no better, more brilliant politician there than Joaquin Castro. So, uh, Honestly, honestly, we'll say this. I can't tell you how lucky I am to have him there as our rep. He's also a friend of ours, but um, we've known him for quite a long time. So rather than read you a, a bio, I'm going to give you three things, all of which you will be tested at the end of the day. Uh, three things about him. Uh, first of all, um, when he was a state rep um, in, in, the news, in Austin, Texas, he serves as the vice chair for higher, higher education. Uh, and it's a very important position. And at the time, he co authored and introduced and passed a bill that was the pathway for emerging institutions. The term two one really took off because of his efforts. And so in 2009, they passed House Bill 51. Um, officially designated UTSA as an emerging research institution. In 2009, the London Times had never heard of us. Yesterday, I received notification of the new postings of the London Times, so the best universities in the world. Keep in mind that they're, they only rank 17,000 universities. <laughs> and of the 17,000 universities in the world, we're in the top 400 in the world. Uh, which puts us in the <laughs> you know, what percent that is, but it's actually, uh, we're in a very, very smart, great um, position. And if you get to Google that, by the way, just put um, World, World University Rankings, uh, Times, World University Rankings, and you'll see the, who we are now competing with and, and better than. But you know, we're now in the top five public institutions in the state of Texas. Back then, we were not even in the top 10. So we, we're moving in the right direction thanks to something you began, and as a consequence, having a lot of uh, matching money from the state that came along. So thank you for that. Um, I think in terms of a concept, an idea that makes you think, is his idea of building the infrastructure of opportunity. Building the infrastructure of opportunity. It is so well said, it says so many things. And what it really means is that he does care that the future of UTSA and all the institutions here, that there's a place for our citizens, our communities, uh, and individuals, whether they come from the low income, blue collar group, or wherever they come from, that they'll find here in Texas and in places like higher education uh, the welcome mat. And then we extend to them, and as a consequence of them being here, they will be better, more skilled, and have better shots at terrific kinds of opportunities in the future, whether it's work or whether it's a, a passion that they follow. Um, the third point being that he, um, while in Congress, and he is, he is uh, called upon by a lot of people. Uh, we, we may not see the passages of a massive number of bills, but uh, no one is busier in D.C. because he is a rational voice. And if you've not had a chance to see him on, on CNN or MSNBC, where they say, well, okay, we got all these crazy ideas. And the congressman just sort of settled down. This, this is the way the world works. And, uh, and it's just refreshing, really, to see someone with such a rational voice, uh, with a can-do attitude, and the feeling is, I'm, I'm with you. We're going to make America you know, a great society, and it's already a great society now. And we can move it. We can move it up all the time. But do it in a way without just sort of stereo. 
and for that I'm really grateful and and for that since you already know the three points well we're ready to welcome our congressman Castro Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Romo, and I want to say, uh, first of all, how amazing it is to be here, and thank you to all the students and faculty members and other folks who've come today. You have such an incredible president. I was uh, asking him on his way up here. I was not sure whether it was his 16th or his 17th year, but his 16th year, and you have done tremendous things with this university, and I believe that in the very near future, it will be recognized as a tier one university here in San Antonio. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you also to uh, Albert Garisales and Mimi Yu who helped organize this and coordinate all the logistics. Uh, I know how much hard work goes into all of it, so I want to say thank you all. Also to the Council General, Council General Amano, thank you for coming from Houston and all the work you're doing. He just got installed in December, and this is his third visit to San Antonio. So welcome back. And to our distinguished scientists and other guests, thank you for your presence here today. Uh, well, I am Joaquin Castro, and I represent part of our city, about half of our city, in the United States Congress, in the House of Representatives and I am in my second term. I served before that for 10 years in the state legislature. So if there's anybody here who's wondering, uh, I'm not the former mayor of San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> that was my twin brother. Yeah. Uh, my brother and I, although we're uh, very much, we look very much alike, I used to tell people that there were basically two ways to tell us apart. There's a quick way and an easy way. And the quick way for many years is that my brother was married and I wasn't. So if you, if you could look real quick, you could see on our ring finger that he, Julian was a married one and I was a bachelor. But believe it or not, a few years ago, I actually convinced somebody to marry me. <laughs> and my wife, Anna, is from the Valley originally and graduated from UT Pan Am down there, now UT RGV. And uh, we have uh, two beautiful kids, uh, Andrea Elena, who's about two years old, and our son, uh, Roman Victor, who's eight weeks old. So, and so now, the only way to tell Leon and I apart is that uh, I'm a lot better looking than Leon. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, it is an honor to serve our city, and one of the best jobs that I have up there is being co-chair of the U.S.-Japan Caucus in the House of Representatives. Uh, I coach, I co-chair that with a Republican, um, who is Congressman Reichert from Washington State now. Uh, the Republican co-chair has changed a few times. As he, uh, the Republicans have gotten promotions uh, and moved on to different things in their own caucus. Uh, but it has been a fascinating work that we've been able to undertake. And let me tell you a little bit about how it got started. So about two and a half or three years ago now, a group of folks approached us and asked whether we'd be interested in starting this caucus. And you might wonder, why would somebody who is a Mexican-American from San Antonio have an interest in starting the U.S.-Japan caucus? Uh, particularly among the many folks in Congress who could have done that. Well, I want to tell you a little bit of a little story that many of us are familiar with, but perhaps some aren't. And that's the story of how one Japanese company in Toyota, I believe, has transformed our city. In 2003, Toyota Manufacturing Corporation made the decision to locate its sixth North American manufacturing plant right here in San Antonio. Now, you might think that many businesses come and go from a city decide to locate in places like San Antonio or Dallas or Austin or somewhere else. What's so special about that? The way Toyota relocated to San Antonio created a model that I had never seen before and I don't know that I've seen since, at least here in San Antonio. First of all, when they decided to come to our city, they didn't pick the busiest part of the city. They didn't locate out on 1604. Nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that. We're sitting here now. But they chose the south side of San Antonio where there wasn't much development, right? Where you could drive, at the time in 2003, if you drove on 1604, even by then you saw a lot of development in San Antonio and Bear County on the north side. If you drove it on the south side, you would still see long fields and pastures and livestock. A very different picture of those two places 
in San Antonio. So Toyota picked a place that needed a shot in the arm in our city, and it got it, right? It developed with, along with several other suppliers, a company and companies that now employ about close to 6,000 people in San Antonio. And that's the other part of the story. When Toyota decided to come here, they didn't say, we're going to pull, you know, a bunch of people who are going to come from other states and other places, and they're all going to relocate to your city, and you'll have 6,000 new jobs and 6,000 new residents. What they said was, we're going to hire local people from San Antonio, and we're going to go even further. And this is the part that was truly remarkable to me. They said, we're going to pick people who are in business in your city, and we're going to partner with them to make sure that they are part owners in the supply chain. That is something in business and in company relocations that truly is remarkable. And I think they created a blueprint and a model for what other companies should consider doing when they relocate to communities. And so I mean that to say that uh, if there's anybody here from Toyota, and I always praise them, uh, but certainly folks who represent Japanese businesses, that this city is eternally grateful for Toyota's presence and specifically how they came to San Antonio. We appreciate it very much. And so I was very interested for that reason by itself, because I watched them transform the South Side and be a shot in the arm for economic development for our city. Now you can imagine that that's one story that I'm sharing of one Japanese company. That story is replicated in different parts of the United States with Republicans and Democrats on the East and West Coast and in the Midwestern states. And so our caucus is made up of about 70 people of both parties many of whom have strong Japanese companies that employ many people in their districts, others who have, may, may have cultural affinities, particularly in areas where you have heavy Japanese-American presence. Many of those tend to be in places like the West Coast and Hawaii, but also in our cities like Houston, Texas. And so for many reasons, we have a lot of members who stepped up to join our caucus. And it's been wonderful. We've received uh, uh, the Japanese, basically the, Jap the equivalent of the U.S. House of Representatives or the U.S. Congress is known as the Japanese Diet. So essentially their members of parliament have come over and we've received them, members of the Diet from all parties, to talk about building and strengthening the relationship between the United States and Japan. So this caucus has allowed us to do great things. In August, a few of us went and visited with Prime Minister Abe. Uh, we also visited with Caroline Kennedy, who's the United States Ambassador uh, to Japan who really is, of course, she's a daughter of former President Kennedy, uh, really is a gem for our country, and is working very hard in representing our nation well in Tokyo. We also sat with members of the Foreign Ministry and the Defense Ministry. This was at a time, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, when Japan was going through a very controversial debate in the country about uh, their affirmative defense legislation or their their peace and security legislation, as it's known there. Uh, that was a very contentious debate within the Diet. Uh, Prime Minister Abe expended a lot of political capital to pass that legislation to make sure that it got done. And so we were able to play a role and let them know, the legislators in Japan know, that the United States considers Japan our most trusted and special ally in the Pacific region. And so that's been very important, to open up that, that dialogue between lawmakers in both countries. And let me tell you, as I describe that relationship, what exactly is at stake now? And I want us to think about the last two, the last one or two years, the last two years really, in the history of our country and in the history of the world. And I want you to put this in the context of the politics that are dominating our nation's discussion now. So let's think about the Middle East for a second and the ongoing conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. <coughs> you think about the fact that terrorism now between affiliates of ISIS and Al-Qaeda is franchised across the Middle East and North Africa, and increasingly in other parts of the world. You think about Boko Haram and all of the horror and tragedy that it has ravaged in Africa, countries in Africa. <coughs> you think about what's happened closer to our own country, the Central American women and children from the Northern Triangle countries who arrived here ten, tens of thousands in the last two years. Many of them fleeing desperation, or all, just about all of them, fleeing desperation and destitution and gang violence 
in their home countries. You think about the fact that the war in Syria, specifically, has created the largest migration in Europe since World War II, and how all of the countries there in the European Union have been addressing that and dealing with it and trying to accommodate the migrants who've arrived in their nations. You think about other conflicts, like the conflict between Russia and its invasion of the Ukraine, the conflict between Russia and Turkey, and the jet that was shot down. You also think about the peace processes that have gone on. Of course, the ongoing peace process uh, between Israeli, the Israelis and the Palestinians, but also the Iran nuclear deal, and also the reestablishment of diplomatic relations with Cuba, and the President's visit just last week to a nation that no U.S. President had visited for 90 years, and the significance of the reestablishment of those diplomatic ties. So you think of all of those things that are occurring in this world which has been tumultuous, quite honestly, for the last few years, and think about what is at stake for America in this generation and for the generations to come. There are many people in this room who are more senior to me and have seen much more, and there are also many people here who represent a generation of Americans that will be here for 50, for 60, and hopefully for you all, 70 years or more. You'll have very long lives and we'll see a lot. This is a world that demands American leadership. And it's also a world that demands American leadership with strong allies. And that's why our alliance with Japan is especially important. The one region of the world, as I went through those things that I didn't mention, is the Asian region, and specifically in East Asia. You think about the countries in East Asia and the economic power, the economic footprint that they have around the world. China, for example, is the second largest economy in the world, behind our own. Japan is right behind it at number three. South Korea is at number 14. And these continue to grow. So the economic impact of these countries is just incredible. They are also, all of them, important trading partners to us, and important trading, partner, important trading partners to places like Europe and the European Union. And so, as we think about what's going on in Asia, and we think about also the tensions there. You know, a few years ago, you guys probably heard that the president talked about a rebalancing, a pivot to Asia, as he called it. And some people wondered, well, what does the president mean by that? Does it mean that you're going to talk about these nations more, that you're going to visit them more, that you're trying to do more trade with them, that you're concerned about security legislation and security issues? And quite honestly, it means all of those things. And I think in the intervening years, we've seen the president back up his words by recommitting the United States engagement in the Asia-Pacific region, and in East Asia in particular. There was today a, a very harrowing story, I don't know if some of you caught it, about the last few years and the aggressiveness of China in the South and East China Seas, and how recently Two ships, a Chinese ship and an American ship, were experiencing tense moments because American ships, in allegiance to our allies in the region, have been traversing the seas there to make sure that that commercial passageway, which is so important to commercial trade throughout the world, is a place where all of those nations feel free for their vessels to traverse so that they can, they can carry out their commercial trade and their business. But China has gotten much more aggressive in the Senkaku Islands, and the Spratly Islands, in the seven islands in this region, also in the, in the South China Sea. And so there is this tension that has developed over the last several years, military tension between the United States and China. And we have to make sure that the United States remains a leader in that region, that we reaffirm our relationship with South Korea and with Japan so that, so that it is clear, you know, China, again, is a very important trading partner to us, uh, has been helpful in accomplishing certain things that we wanted to do around the world. With the Iran nuclear deal, for example, uh, they went along. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't veto it uh, in the UN, which is helpful. Sanctions for North Korea, again, China has been more recently helpful. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a good relationship with China, but we also want to make sure 
that the waters around Asia are as they have been and should be, which are waters that are free for each of those nations to traverse. But that has created some tension. So as I talk about the importance of this relationship and three, three particular things, I want you guys to think about that context and what it means for the United States, the challenges for the United States, and also the challenges for the region, a region that is only growing and will continue to grow in importance for the world. So when I visited uh, Japan in August and met with Prime Minister Abe, uh, our delegation met with Prime Minister Abe, there were really three pieces, three issues that we addressed most, we spent most of our time on. The first one was uh, security legislation. Because as I mentioned, the security legislation was being debated at the time, and it was very contentious. Uh, after war, since World War II, the 70 years since, Japan has essentially been a pacifist nation. It's in the Constitution, right? So any changes to that are obviously uh, incredibly controversial, very hotly debated. Uh, when we went for meetings uh, and pulled up to the foreign ministry, there were folks, and, and we went by the diet, there were folks that were protesting. Uh, there were Japanese that were out on the street uh, showing their disapproval of it. Uh, there were also folks who obviously su supported it enthusiastically. But what it has meant for them is a change, a slight change in posture. To me, and what I convey to them, is that the change in legislation, and the president supports it, and our caucus supports it, is a way to make sure that Japan is not jumping into every fight, right? That's not the intention of the legislation. But given China's aggressiveness and other realities in the region, it's also a way to make sure that Japan is prepared for whatever comes. For any nation, the balance should be to never be trigger happy or anxious to jump into war or engage others in a hostile way. But on the other hand, you also want to be a nation that is prepared for anything. And that legislation represents a way for Japan to be prepared. And so we conveyed to Prime Minister Abe uh, and to the Diet members that we were supportive of it and we we're glad that it passed. And the second issue that we spoke about is energy. You know, Japan has had very high energy costs in the last several years. In the United States, in the, in the United States, uh, we have been very fortunate, uh, except obviously recently with the, the, the decrease in gas prices and the decrease in oil prices, but as you all know, for several years because of the Eagle Ford Shale in this region, we have been pumping out a lot of oil and a lot of natural gas. Well, right now, a lot of our allies around the world, including Japan, uh, are paying, number one, they're paying high prices for this energy, but also, a lot of folks are getting their energy from countries uh, that are quite hostile, in many ways, to the United States, and sometimes even quite hostile to the very countries who are purchasing that energy. The best example of that is probably Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, even after this conflict between Russia and the Ukraine over the last few years, the Ukraine is still receiving a lot of its energy resources dependent upon Russia for its energy resources. The same thing with Germany. Germany was receiving about 30% of its energy from Russia. So you might ask, well, what's the importance of that? Well, I'll tell you why it matters. Because when you try to get a coalition together to impose sanctions on a country, in this case Russia, the more, the more engagements and relationships and entanglements that they have that are pecuniary and financial, the tougher it is for our allies to stand with us when we want to take action against a country like Russia who, who invaded the Ukraine. And so it's important where we can, I believe, to be able to supply energy to our allies like Japan and Germany and other countries around the world. So I was one of the Democrats in the Congress that supported expediting our liquefied natural gas, our LNG exports, and much of that work is done here in San Antonio and in South Texas. And if we can do that, then we can create a situation where Japan and our allies are hopefully re receiving their energy at a cheaper price, but also are in a place where they can stand up when countries violate other countries, when countries violate the sanctity of sovereign borders. And so that legislation and that, the, the legislation on security and the legislation on energy are incredibly important. And also the third issue that we talked about is economic development. You know, the relationship between the United States and Japan has come a long way. 
If you think about its development since World War II, these were two nations who once upon a time obviously were at war with each other, but for 70 years now have developed into becoming the very best of friends. But let me take you back to those of you that lived through the 1980s. If you remember the 1980s, the 1980s, the country was very fearful of Japan. Japan's economy was very much on the rise. Uh, you know, in the United States, there was fear of, of Japan buying up assets in the United States. And there, were, there was this, there was, uh, sadly, a kind of anti-Japanese sentiment in the country. And that has changed incredibly, thankfully. And so part of the big reason that that's changed is because there's been massive investment both from the United States in Japan, but also Japanese companies investing here in the United States. And you think about it, as I mentioned earlier, we have the first and third largest economies in the world. We are each other's you know, top three trading partners uh, within the world. And so there's incredible good that we can do together. I see all of that continuing. I see the coming years, uh, con that relationship and that prosperity for each of our nations continuing. Uh, you know, more recently in the Congress, uh, the TPP legislation was considered, uh, you know, depending on what happens, that may or may not come to pass. But whether it, whether it passes the Congress or not, this relationship, the fundamental basis for it, is larger than one trade agreement, however important that may be. And so to those of you that are studying the U.S.-Japan relationship, uh, those of you that are going to engage in the U.S.-Japan relationship, I hope that you will be a generation of Americans who continues to build it, who continues to take it to new heights, because that relationship is only going to grow in importance, and I think can, can continue, continue to grow in prosperity. And then finally, I want to say, you know, thank you to UTSA and specifically the East Asian Institute with regard to your engagement on Japan issues. You know, so much of so much of the think so many of the think tanks and so much of the thought on this relationship, for lack of a better word, tends to come out of the two coasts, the East and the West Coast. And UTSA and San Antonio and Texas make a strong statement by the formation and the presence and the scholarship of the East Asia Institute. And so I want to thank, President, I want to thank you for all of that and for that work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it also will go a long way. This relationship and the coordination with the University of Tokyo will go a long way in making sure that UTSA is recognized for its scholarship and also will go a long way in moving us even closer to Tier 1 status. And that will be something that will be great uh, for everybody here, for the students and also for the city. So thank you all very much, and I hope that you guys will do everything that you can to build the U.S.-Japan relationship. Thank you. But we have our Council General from, from Houston who is um, presenting, uh, and he will offer, um, Destro Romano will offer a few remarks, uh, and then we'll have a new remark. So, Council General, please. Thank you, President. <clears throat> the Honorable uh, Congressman uh, Joaquin Castoro, uh, Dr. Ricardo Rumo, uh, Rumo, President of the UTSA. This is guest, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very excited and honored to please to be here to witness the esteemed Congressman's lecture now and to be presented at such a uh, a uh, very prestigious school as the University of Texas San Antonio. I am incredibly grateful to uh, be here to witness Congressman Castro's precious and uh, splendid remarks on the future of the, uh, the current and the future of the U U.S. relationship. 
Congress, Congressman Castor has been a great uh, friend to Japan's relationship, Japan's relationships with the United States. And uh, so, uh, taking this opportunity, again, uh, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation uh, on his idea for all this support. Thank you so much. By the way, <clears throat> I, uh, just, uh, I arrived uh, there in Texas just uh, uh, December 22nd of the, uh, last year. Just I, I passed the, uh, uh, almost three months now. But uh, I'm so lucky and happy to repeat uh, the, uh, during such kind of a short period, I repeated uh, the uh, three times here because of the, uh, I, feel, I feel strong bondage uh, the, uh, me, between me and uh, the San Antonio. I think so too. <laughs> And also, uh, San Antonio has uh, the, uh, had uh, the strong and uh, deep relationship with Japan for many years. San Antonio shares a long-standing sister city relationship, for example, with Kumamoto, Japan. There is also the presence of many Japanese business here, uh, represented by the Toyota also, and also both small and large, such as Toyota's manufacturing plant, uh, the other time, also they admitted that they are Toyota manufacturer. I'm amazing. Uh, they, I've never yet seen such a kind of big uh, uh, campus and uh, compound and such. Uh, and also, most advanced, uh, uh, advanced of their technology here. So that uh, they are, I'm so happy to see that uh, they are such a very big uh, Japanese technology and uh, uh, people there and to contribute to uh, the uh, good economic relation between the Japan and the United States. And also that the, the, uh, uh, the city uh, possesses a deep cultural and spiritual ties with Japan, as represented by the Japanese monument to Aramo heroes, commemorated the, on the centennial anniversary in the 2014. Japan and San Antonio also share the active exchange of the Japanese people and Americans who are committed to maintaining this uh, impressive international connection. In fact, the appearance of all of you here today is, uh, is further proof of San Antonio is a pivotal partner with Japan. So I do not think it is too much to say that San Antonio is indeed a key place in uh, strengthening the future Japan and the United States relationship. In addition to the excellent such a relationship, Japan as a with the city of Santanio, both economically and culturally, I deeply believe Japan has a robust future in Texas, thanks to growing activities in a variety of fields. Ladies and gentlemen, as you well know, the alliance with the United States, just uh, Congress, uh, uh, Congressman uh, Castor already said, the alliance of the United States is the most important axis of foreign policy for our Japan. But it is indispensable not only for reinforcing Japanese security, but also for ensuring Japanese economic growth, which uh, our Prime Minister Abe said that uh, Abenomics, uh, uh, his very peculiar uh, economic policy, has been tackling to stably divide. Additionally, I'm assured that our bilateral relations are of great interest and profit to the United States as well. So, in such a current situation, I will try, I will try my best <coughs> to uh, continue to uh, appeal the importance of Japanese presence for this country and simultaneously promote the act attractiveness of this country, especially Texas, to Japan. This is because I'm sure that <coughs> it is not too much to say that it is most useful not only for prosperity of both countries, but also for prosperity of the world to enhance the bilateral national interest between Japan and the United States. Furthermore, 2015, last year, was the 70th anniversary of the end of the World War II. On this anniversary, Japan had reiterated its determination not only to work the path of pacifism, but also to contribute positively to the peace of the world. As a part of this, last September, the Japanese Diet admitted a bill for the uh, legislation, the of the legislation for peace and security. It's a new uh, uh, security issue that they, 
uh, the uh, Honorable Commissioner and the Ho Chi Minh Professor are already uh, <coughs> presented to your side. Uh, thank you very much. And also there are through such efforts, Japan will contribute to the prosperity and the peace of the world in close cooperation with the United States. Following this example, I'd like to contribute to strengthen the cooperation between our two countries as much as possible in my position of Consul General of Japan in this Texas. <coughs> Lastly, but at least, in conclusion, I'm very happy to share my uh, insight with all of you. And again, I greatly appreciate being uh, granted this precious opportunity to speak to you following the Congressman's lecture on the future of bilateral relationships. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, and uh, if I could add to that real quick, you're right, you know, a commitment, a shared commitment to democracy, and in Japan we have found a partner around the world who is committed to patrolling human rights abuses and also to combating terrorism. They've been very helpful in those endeavors. So, first question, quick. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Congressman, and at this time I'd like to hear from General Counsel as well. Uh, what is what is the position of the, your caucus upon the reactivation of Japanese nuclear power plants? And uh, as I said, if there's time, I'd like to hear the general counsel's uh, statement on the official position of the Japanese government. Sure. Uh, well, you know, um, of course, the tragedy a few years ago has forced Japan into different sources of energy, and that's when I spoke about supplying natural gas. Um, the United States situation is one where we have, as the President has described it, an all of the above situation. And of course, I can't speak for the Japanese government and how they'll proceed. I know that one or more of the plants has been reopened uh, in their intervening years, and I would suspect that that continues. But again, that's the country's decision. Uh, we want to be a nation that is supplying them when they need it uh, with energy that's affordable uh, and energy that's coming from an allied source uh, rather than sources that we consider more hostile. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, second question. Okay, right here. <laughs> You're the winner. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the interesting uh, And uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, representing uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. So my job is to uh, promote and uh, use Japan and uh, partnership in science and technology. So how can I uh, help you or your vision? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, my question is on how the science and technology cooperation can play a significant role in your vision. Well first, please spend more time at UTSA with these wonderful <laughs> folks. You know, of course, there's a wonderful cooperation between NASA and Japan that's going on right now, which is very cutting edge and innovative. Uh, but uh, I guess my request to you, and uh, let me preface this by saying that one of the wonderful things in this role has been seeing the strong support societies that exist in helping to build. These are civil societies, right? Civilian societies, not just government. Like, obviously, I'm part of the government. Um, the Council General is here, he's part of the Japanese government, but just volunteer civilians who are getting together to help strengthen the relationship. So my plea to you would be, uh, when you can, to come to places like this and get to know the incredible minds 
who are here, who are sometimes uh, hidden gems and not always celebrated, sometimes tucked away, uh, and sometimes not, uh, sometimes celebrated, but there are incredible resources here, incredible partnerships to be made at places like UTSA. So most of all, thank you for being here. That means it's going to be a hard question. <laughs> Welcome, Congressman. Uh, my name is Andrew Hubbard. I serve the student body president elect uh, here at UTSA. So, on behalf of all the students, welcome. Thank you. Uh, to you and the general consulate. Um, as a student who is uh, increasingly interested in this uh, lecture, may have uh, been the catalyst to an uh, increase. Uh, interest in either visiting Japan or being more uh, active uh, into the relationship uh, between this uh, hemisphere and, and the other. What, uh, what are some next steps for us as students uh, to partake in uh, to be more, become more active and to become more of a participant in these, uh, these new increasing opportunities? Uh, if that is your interest, and I would say please get a hold of my office and the caucus, and we can put you in touch with the different civil societies, the support societies here in the United States, uh, and there are active chapters here in Texas, and you know there, there are exchange programs, programs that send students, American students, to Tokyo and other places in Japan, uh, so that they can you know study there, get to know the country, build a relationship, foster the relationship. Last week I was in Washington, and Ambassador Sasai. Uh, was hosting, I guess about, uh, must have been about a dozen students who were going to be going on, who were leaving the next morning actually, for Tokyo. And so that's just one example of the Japanese effort to engage American students. And it's important to engage American students uh, more than it is sometimes even people my age, I'm 41, uh, because y'all really are both on the cutting edge of scholarship today and also represent a generation that will be around for much longer. So you're going to be the ones who will resolve conflicts in the world. You'll be the ones that deal with conflicts in the world. You'll be the American electorate that decides how engaged the United States is with other nations or how much we pull back, right? But the relationship with Japan, I hope that all of us over the years will help sustain it and build it uh, because it's one of the best we have around the world. But please reach out to me and I'll be glad to help. Thank you all very much. Thank you. 
But now, first step, you need to put the Dharma doll somewhere visible in your home or your office. I think the house floor would be a great place for that. <laughs> Put it on my desk on the house floor. Okay. We actually don't have desks. So, so you can focus on retrieving your goal. And step four. Once you retrieve your goal, please draw another eye. Say thank you to the download. Thank <laughs> you. 